record this. There we go. Okay. So let's uh, let's talk about blood. Okay. All right. So the components of blood. What is blood made of? That's what we want to take a look at, right? So the liquid fraction of your whole blood is called plasma. It's called blood plasma, right? There are there are solid portions of your blood and there are liquid portions of your blood, just like when we spoke about uh, cells back in semester one. When we talked about cytoplasm, we talked about solid parts of the cytoplasm called organelles, and then there was a liquid portion of the cytoplasm that was called cytosol. Same thing happens with your blood. You have a liquid portion, which is going to be called your blood plasma, and then you have your solid portions, which are going to be called formed elements, and you can see that term right here, formed elements. Normal volumes of blood. Now, these are averages, obviously. <clears throat> You have 2.6 liters of plasma in your body. So 2.6 liters of your blood will be the blood plasma and the formed elements will um, be about two and a half liters. So on whole, on average, an average human being has four to six liters on average. And that ranges from seven to 9% of your total body weight. And again, these are averages. There are gonna be people that are lower than that. There are gonna be people that are higher than that. It all depends on your body size, your body, and your, your your genetics and things like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, here is a nice little diagram for for you to take a look at, and it, it breaks down the different parts of the blood very nicely. So you can see this little vial of blood. Now, when you get blood taken, it doesn't necessarily look like this. Okay. It doesn't look like yellow on the top and red on the bottom. It kind of looks red uniform all the way through, right? If I were to, you know, take a picture of a vial of blood, okay, it would kind of just look, oops, I spelled vial wrong. Okay, it would kind of look all red like that, okay? But if you took blood uh, that has been spun, or separated in a centrifuge, okay, your blood looks very different. This is actual blood, okay? This is an individual's blood. So it's very, very different from what that other picture looked like, right? So here's another picture of blood, okay? And you can see these two very distinct areas. So when you spin something at a very, very high speed, what you get is you get separation between the heavy things and the light things. The heavy things when you spin blood very fast in a centrifuge is the formed elements. Those are the heaviest parts of the blood because they're solids, right? Those are your red blood cells, white blood cells, things like that. The lighter stuff, which sits at the top because it's not as heavy, is gonna be the liquid portion of your blood, which is the plasma. So that's why it separates and looks like this, okay? So let's take a look at what each portion is really made of just generally. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about each one of these uh, individually. All right, so the plasma is made of basically three components. And I don't need you to know these necessarily, I don't need you to memorize all of these things here. Okay, but you know, I'm, I'm going to emphasize some of them. Okay, so, and I don't need you to memorize the percentages at all. Okay, so don't even bother, you know, don't sit there and try to memorize proteins or 7% solutes are 2%, don't worry about that. Just know that your blood plasma is made of proteins, water, and other solutes. And we'll talk about what that means, right? So as far as proteins go, okay, proteins, um, the proteins that are found in your blood are these. And the only one that you might've even heard of are called albumins. And you might not even have even heard of albumins, but albumins are uh, the proteins that we find in, in eggs. Okay, so egg whites are pretty much all albumin. And these are all gonna be found in your, uh, your, in your blood, in your plasma. You have water, 91% H2O. And then you have things called solutes, other solutes. And what a solute is, is something that's dissolved in water or something that's dissolved in something else, right? So if you have uh, sugar water or if you have iced tea, right? If you took powder and put it into water from the iced tea mix and you mixed it around, the iced tea mix would be the solutes right? Um, what solutes do you have in your blood? You have ions, 
things like uh, potassium, calcium ions. And what's an ion? Remember, I, I'm not sure if we went through that a lot in semester one, but an ion is an atom that's lost or gained an electron. Um, that has a charge, right? And, and that's important in our bodies when we're talking about buffers and things like that. So you have calcium ions, you have sodium ions, you have chlorine ions floating around your body, um, hydroxy, hydroxide ions, all types of things like that. You have nutrients, dissolved nutrients in your blood plasma. You have things like lipids, you have things like carbohydrates, simple sugars, amino acids. Okay, um, nucleic acids, things like that. You have waste products. Okay, you have lactic acid, you have carbon dioxide. Okay, things that your body is trying to get rid of. Okay, gases, again, carbon dioxide, oxygen, things like that. Okay, you have regulatory substances like hormones floating around in your blood. Okay, so that's the liquid portion, that's the plasma of your blood. The solid portions, the um, formed elements that we call them. You have platelets, you have leukocytes, and anytime you see the term site, C-Y-T-E, that means cell, okay? So a leukocyte is a white blood cell. Leuco means white, site means cell, white blood cell. And you don't have that many compared to the rest of what this jar of vial is gonna be um, composed of, and that's erythrocytes. Urethro means red, site means cell. So a urethrocyte is a red blood cell. And take a look at the number, right? If you took all these numbers and added them up, 6.2 million plus 340,000, okay, plus 9,000, you're like at like 6.5, 6.6 million cells total in this whole vial, right? And out of that 6.6 .6 million cells, 6.2 of them, 6.2 million of them are red blood cells. So think about that, right? So out of all your blood, out of all the formed elements, over 90% of all the cells in the formed elements are gonna be red blood cells. You do not have a lot of white blood cells floating around in your blood. That's not how your white blood cells travel. Your white blood cells travel throughout your body through your lymphatic system. They don't really travel through your cardiovascular system unless they're needed, right? It's kind of like um, the army. You don't need the army until you, unless you're at war and you need protection, right? Uh, so the army, the, the soldiers and things stay in their barracks or stay in their forts and you don't see them until they're needed. And that's exactly what leukocytes are kind of like, right? We, we release leukocytes or did leukocytes diffuse into the system when they're needed. And usually that's because of some type of infection, right? If you just took someone's blood and you looked at you know normal blood numbers, um, if they don't have an infection, if they're not sick, this number should be fairly low. If, if they are sick, if they have an infection, if you have strep throat, if you have an ear infection, uh, if you have a virus, okay, depending on the virus, these white blood cell numbers will go up, right? Now with HIV, that's a little different because HIV actually kills these cells. So that number is gonna go really, really low, okay? But that's a whole nother story for another um, lecture. If we take a look at these, at this uh, section here, leukocytes, we can see that there are five different leukocytes listed, okay? And we're gonna talk about these individually later on, but for now, we just wanna know that there are different types of white blood cells, okay? We don't need to know the names right now, okay? We're gonna need to know the names later, but we don't need to know them right now. So we have neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils. These are all different types of white blood cells and they all do different things and they all have a different function and they all look a little bit different. And that's what we're gonna talk about later, but there's only one type of red blood cell and that's called a erythrocyte. Okay, so many types of leukocytes, one type of erythrocyte. Okay, and that's what your blood, the contents of your blood are. Okay, the pH of your blood um, is somewhat alkaline alkaline now, if you remember the pH scale, Let's see if I can get my, uh, my pen here. Let's see if this works, no, it doesn't work. Okay. So uh, if you guys remember the pH scale, pH scale goes from zero to 14. 
Let me try to do this again. I need to get one of those fancy uh, teacher uh, tools where I can write on the screen. Okay, it goes from zero to 14. Uh, zero being very uh, acid, very acidic. And uh, 14 being very basic. Okay, so like things, for example, that fit into these terms, things like um, hydrochloric acid would be on the zero side. Uh, things like um, lemon juice would be closer to the acidic side or citric acid, right? That's uh, what's in lemon juice. Things that would be on the basic side would be things like Windex, uh, ammonia, things that are like cleaning products, okay? Things like that. In the middle, you have the number seven and that's gonna be neutral, okay? Uh, anything that is um, neutral is going to have an equal amount of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. That's what makes, um, that's, that's how we measure things on the pH scale, how many H's something has compared to how many OH's something has or the solution has. If the amount of OH's and H's are equal, right? If you have OH and H, that gives you H2O, right? And that's what, that's neutral. That's what's in the middle. So your blood is a pH of 7.3 to 7.45. And that's slightly basic, right? It's, it's, it's almost neutral. It's closer to neutral than it is to really, to being alkaline, but it is slightly uh, alkaline. And alkaline means basic, okay? That's another term for basic. If your blood pH decreases and it gets closer to seven or even closer to 6.9, we call that acidosis, which means that your blood is entering or getting closer to that acid number or that acid part of the scale than it is to where it needs to be slightly basic. Uh, that could damage your cells. And this happens a lot, um, well, not a lot, but when this does happen, it, it does usually happen to people who are diabetic. Okay, people who are diabetic or, or even people who don't know they're diabetic, but, but are. And what happens is what, what glucose will do, sugars, sugars will actually cause your blood pH to go down. And if you are diabetic and you are eating lots of sugars and, you're, and you don't take your insulin, okay, and, you're, and your pancreas isn't making your insulin, you can fall into something called ketoacidosis, which is um, your blood going closer to that acid side of the, of the scale. This happens a lot to people who don't know they're diabetic, right? They, they're um, they're pre-diabetic. They might not even know they have this condition, okay? But they're eating sugars. They're not really monitoring it because they don't know they have a problem really. And, and they can fall into this problem because their pancreas isn't working as it should and they can fall into ketoacidosis. Okay, just a little fun fact for you. Uh, blood donations, okay, many of you have given blood over the years, maybe, uh, at school, at blood drives and things like that. There are approximately 14 million units of blood donated every year, which is a lot. Um, you can store blood for about six weeks, okay, before you need to, you know, dispose of it. And then we're going to talk about um, blood typing in a minute, okay, it's going to be uh, the majority of, of what we talk about today. Okay, so blood types. We have to discuss a little bit of genetics first before we can get into, into blood types because we need to understand what blood types are. Okay, so with blood types, with, uh, with genetics, you, you get things called alleles. Okay, and an allele is a basically half of a gene, okay? Your, your father gives you half of your genetics, okay? So you have 46 chromosomes. Half of those chromosomes come from your dad. Half of those chromosomes come from your mom. They match up, okay? They're, they're kind of like pairs of shoes, right? When you buy a box, of, when you buy a, a pair of shoes, they come with a left and they come with a right. That's kind of how your chromosomes are li are matched up. Okay, your your dad gives you chromosome number one. Your mom gives you chromosome number one. They match up like a left and a right shoe. Your dad gives you chromosome number two. Your mom gives you chromosome number two. They match up like do they do a pair of shoes. Same thing with number three. Number three from mom from dad. Four and four from mom and dad, and so on and so forth, all the way down 
through chromosome 22, right? So if, if mom gives you chromosome one through 22, dad gives you chromosome one through 22, they both give you a sex chromosome, which is gonna determine your sex. Uh, that equals 46. So 22, 22, that's 44. And then one sex chromosome for each, that's 45 and 46. The thing about the chromosomes, okay? So here's chromosome number one from mom. Each, there's little portions of the chromosome that are going to code for different characteristics, right? So this tiny little portion at the top might be for your hair color. This little portion underneath might be for your eye color. This other little portion underneath that might be, you know, your ability to make lactase and, and so on and so forth. All humans have the same general information in the same areas of their chromosomes. So if eye color is here on mom's chromosome, eye color is going to be here on dad's chromosome. If lactase production is here on mom's chromosome, lactase production will be here on dad's chromosome. They, that's, how, um, that's how chromosomes work. That's why they come in pairs. Now, the information in that eye color area might be different than the information in this eye color area, right? This one might say blue, this one might say brown, but they, they both code for eyes, for the color of your eyes. And the variation, okay, is, uh, is what makes each individual different from one another, right? If, if, if mom says brown eyes and dad says blue eyes, that's going to give you brown eyes because of something called dominance, right? Brown eyes are dominant over blue eyes. And what that means is, is when brown eye allele, or when that gene is present, it's gonna overpower the one that's uh, recessive. So you got dominant and recessiveness, okay? So blood type, the reason I bring this up is because blood types have alleles too, right? Your, your mom gives you an allele, a gene for blood type, and your dad gives you an allele for blood type. And then depending on what those alleles are, they have to fight it out and see which one is gonna be dominant or recessive. Okay, so like for hair color and eye color, typically the darker colors were, are always gonna be more dominant over the lighter colors, right? Brown eyes are gonna dominate over blue eyes. Uh, black hair will dominate over blonde hair or red hair. Um, it's not always like that. I mean, there's, um, po there's a, a gene called polydactyly. Polydactyly means you have six fingers on your hand. Okay, and that's a dominant trait. Okay, but a lot of people don't have six fingers on their hands. Okay, so it's, it's, it, you know, dominance always doesn't determine, you know, um, or isn't determined by how, how often you see it. Same thing for dwarfism, right? Uh, dwarfism is dominant. Uh, what we call normal height, okay, is recessive, okay? But we see a lot more uh, normal height people than we do uh, dwarf people. Okay, so it's not always about um, the numbers game. But with blood types, you have three different alleles. You have allele A, you have allele B, and you have allele O. Now you can only get two of them because your dad gives you one and your mom gives you one, right? So you're, you're gonna get two of those three. And the combination of those two that you get are gonna determine your blood type. So if you get A from mom, the allele for blood type A from mom, and you get the allele for blood type A from dad, then you have type A blood. Why is that? Because A is the only thing that's present here and that's going to give you type A blood. Same thing goes for B. If mom gives you B and dad gives you B, you get B blood, type B blood. Now what's dominant and what's recessive in this picture, okay? A and B, alleles are what we call co-dominant, okay? A and B are co-dominant, which means neither one of them overpowers the other. A will not overpower B and B will not overpower A, just like um, or, or different than um, eye colors, right? If, if you have brown eyes, it dominates blue eyes. That's not what's happening here. Okay, A and B do not dominate over one another. So they're co-dominant, which means that they both get expressed at the same time. So if mom gives you A blood or dad, doesn't matter. If one of your parents gives you A blood and the other parent gives you B blood, as far as the alleles go, 
you will get type AB. You will get blood type AB because both of them are codominant, which means neither one of them is going to lose, which means they're both going to be expressed. Okay. So now let's talk about O, because O is the O is the troublemaker. Okay. O is recessive. O equals recessive. I can't spell anything today. Recess. No. Okay. O is recessive, which means it's always going to get dominated by the other two. Okay. In this case, A dominates over O, B dominates over O. So O is completely, completely recessive in this case. Okay. So what does that mean? So let me just get rid of this. Get rid of this. So if you have one parent give you A and the other parent gives you O, because A is dominant over O, you get blood type A. Just like if just it doesn't matter that you have the allele for O, it's recessive to A, so it doesn't show up. It's there. You hold you have it in your body, but it doesn't show up. It doesn't get expressed because A is present. And when A is present, it dominates over O. Same thing goes for B. Because B is codominant with A, one parent gives you B and the other parent gives you O, you have type B blood. Because B dominates over O. Now, how do you get O blood? You get O blood just like people get blue eyes or blonde hair, you have to have two recessive alleles. In order to get blue eyes, you need to have two blue eyed alleles, one from one parent, one from the other parent. Same thing for blood type O. You have to have one O allele from one parent, another O allele from another parent, and that gives you type O blood. There we go. Okay. So now, if we take a look, there are two ways to get A, right? There are two ways here to get A, one and two. One, two. And there are two ways to get type B blood. But there's only one way to get type O blood, and there's only one way to get type AB blood. That means that it is more rare to have type AB blood or to have type O blood because it doesn't happen as frequently, okay? These are not going to happen as frequently because there's only one way to get them. There's two ways to get type A, there's two ways to get type, uh, type B. There's only one way to get type AB and there's only one way to get type O. So it doesn't happen nearly as often. There are a lot less people in the world that have AB or O blood. Now, is that a problem? We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, but this is more rare than this. And then there's what we call negative and positive RH factors, which we'll talk about in a moment. So let's, let's try to understand what this actually means. What's it mean to have type A blood? What's it mean to have type B blood? Okay, I'm gonna open up a, a blank page here so I can write on it. Okay, so let me draw a little cell for you here. So where are my shapes? Insert, oh, insert shape. Okay, I got a little circle. Okay, there's one. I'm gonna copy this guy. Two, there's three. With type A blood, okay, so we'll say this one is type A. Let's see if I can do one of these here. Okay, so here's type A blood, okay. Type A blood 
the reason it's called type A blood is because it has A's all over its surface. It has proteins that we call A proteins all over its surface. Like that. And that's what makes it A blood. We'll say this is B blood. And B blood has B's all over its surface. That's what makes it B blood. We'll say this is AB blood. And AB blood has A's and B's all over its surface. And that's why we call it AB blood. O, however, doesn't have anything on its surface. There's nothing on the surface of O. Okay. Why is this a problem? Why is this important? It's important because if you are a person and you have A blood and all you have on your surface is A's, that's the only thing your body recognizes. Your body is very, very specific about what should be inside of your body. Your body knows what belongs to you and what does not belong to you, okay? If pollen enters your body, your body knows that that pollen does not belong to you. It doesn't know where it came from. It doesn't know what it belongs to. It just knows that this is not a part of you and we need to get it out. So your body will produce an immune response to get rid of the pollen that has entered your nose or entered your lungs or wherever it entered. Now, if you're allergic to these things, you have a different reaction than if you're not allergic, but your body does the same thing. It tries to get rid of that stuff. Same thing for... A, an infection. Your body knows that cell does not belong to you. So it tries to kill it. Okay, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work as good, but that's what your body tries to do. If you get a um, organ transplant, there's always a chance that your body rejects the new organ because your body knows that heart or that kidney that just got implanted into you is not yours. And there's a chance that your body can try to kill that new organ. And that's why it's very, you know, touch and go with, with organ transplants. So if you have blood type A and your body only recognizes A, hold on, I got people chatting, just make sure. Okay, I'll, 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 I might answer your questions as I'm speaking. So let me just continue with this. Okay, so if you have blood type A and that's the only thing that your body recognizes, then blood type B, if that enters your body, your body knows that you don't have bees and we need to get rid of the bees. So we're going to kill the bees. Now that might not, that might not sound like a big deal, but that could cause blood clotting and that can kill you, right? If you, if you have blood type A and you're given blood type B, that could kill you. Okay. Depending on how much of it was given to you, depending on how quickly they act on it, that could 100% kill you because of, you know, blood clots and things like that. So people who have blood type A, cannot receive blood type B in a transfusion because that person does not recognize B proteins. A person who has blood type A cannot get type AB blood either because there are Bs on it and your body doesn't recognize those Bs. It recognizes the As, but it does not recognize the Bs. But your body can take O because there's nothing on O for you to recognize as, as bad, right? There are no proteins on the surface. So your body doesn't think it's harmful. So you can get blood type O. So let's see if I can draw an arrow here. I can just draw an arrow with my little tool here. Okay, so blood type O can be given to someone with blood type A, and that's absolutely fine. Let's take a look at B. If you have blood type B, you cannot receive blood from blood type A because you don't recognize A, and you cannot receive blood from AB because you don't recognize the A portion. But you can take blood from someone who's blood type O. That's absolutely fine because there's nothing on O that you don't recognize. If you have blood type AB, you're in, you're in really good shape because, and here's why, 
you recognize A, so that means someone who is blood type A can give their blood to you. You recognize B, so someone with B blood can give their blood to you. You're AB, so obviously you can get other AB blood, right? And same thing goes for A. People who have type A blood can give to people who have type A, and people who have B blood can get blood from people who have type B, okay? And you can also get blood from O. So everybody can give you blood, okay? You're, you're lucky because every single person can give you blood as far as these blood types go. We didn't talk about um, RH factor yet, but almost everyone can give you blood. Now let's talk about poor blood type O, okay? Blood type O does not recognize A's or B's. So blood type O cannot get blood from A because it doesn't recognize it. It can't get blood from B because it doesn't recognize it. And it can't get blood from AB because it doesn't recognize AB. The only way to get blood, if you're blood type O, is if you're getting blood from another blood type O person. That's the only way for you to get blood. And that gives us names for these two because they're very special. Blood type O is the universal donor, okay? Universal donor. Blood type AB is the universal acceptor. Okay. Because AB can take from anyone and O can give to anyone. Now let's talk about RH factor because that's what makes you A positive or B negative and things like that. Okay. So the thing that makes you negative or positive is something called RH factor. RH factor is a genetic marker. It doesn't help you or harm you in any way if you have or do not have RH. It is a gene that is found in lots of primates uh, throughout evolution. The RH actually stands for recess. Um, it's a species of monkey, recess monkeys. Okay, they have it as well because they're primates just like us. And <clears throat> some human beings have it and some human beings don't. If you have RH, if you have the gene for RH, and again, it doesn't make your blood any better or any worse if you have it or don't have it. It just makes it more of a pain in the butt to receive or give blood. If you have RH on your genes, then you are RH positive. If you do not have RH on your genes or, or in your DNA, then you are RH negative, okay? How does this affect blood and giving blood, okay? It affects blood in, by, by you, if you are RH positive, then you can get blood from other RH positive people. And you can also get blood from RH negative people because there's nothing there for you to not recognize. It's the same principles, right? If, if your body uh, doesn't have the gene for it, you can't recognize it uh, when it's on something else. So let's, let's say this is a person who is A negative, okay? Let's say this person's A negative, which means that it has A negative proteins all over the surface. So it's type A, but it's recess, it's RH negative. This person can get A blood from someone, else, from someone else who has A blood, but that person has to be A negative as well. If it takes the blood from the O person, it can get blood from O person, but it has to be O negative blood. This individual cannot get RH positive blood at all because it, this person's body does not recognize RH, just like it doesn't recognize B. And if it's given RH, then you can have reactions to it. So this individual can get blood from another person who's A negative, or it can get blood from a person who's O negative. But if this person was positive, let's see if I can uh, undo, there we go. If this person was RH positive, 
then this person can get blood from someone who's A positive or A negative. Because A negative, it, it, the gene is not there. There's nothing to recognize, right? It's like, it's like, oh, oh, it doesn't have any proteins on its surface. So A negative is just, it's just a cell that doesn't have any RH on it. So that's fine. So this person can get blood from A positive people. It can get blood from A negative people. It can get blood from O positive people. It can get blood from O negative people, okay? So you've doubled the amount of blood that you can receive just by having RH uh, factor in your, in your blood, right? So if this person was negative, it can only receive A negative or O negative. But now that it's positive, it can get A positive, A negative, O positive, O negative. And the same thing goes for B and AB and O. But let's see, let's take a look at how that affects these two, right? AB, if you're AB positive, then you can receive blood from every single individual on the planet. Think about that, right? If you are AB positive, you can receive blood from A positive people and you can receive blood from A negative people. You can receive blood from B positive people or B negative people. You can receive blood from O positive people or O negative people. It doesn't matter because you have it all, okay? If you are in an accident, and they need to give you a blood transfusion. They don't even have to look in the box to see what kind of blood it is. They can just grab a bag and throw it in your arm. Not that they would do that, okay? But they, they can if they want to because you're AB positive. You can receive blood from anybody in the world at any time, just as long as it's you know, not tainted blood or anything like that. If you're AB negative, you still have a lot to choose from, right? You don't have as much to choose from, but you have a lot to choose from. You can, if you're AB negative, let's see if I can undo that again, put a negative sign here. Okay, if you're AB negative, you can get A negative, you can get B negative, you can get O negative or AB negative blood, right? You still have lots of options. So now let's talk about O. Okay, not only is O rare to begin with, but it's also, it's more rare to have O negative blood. All right, let's let's talk about let's talk about someone who's O positive first. Just stay on a, on a positive note, no pun intended. If you're O positive, you can get blood from people who are O positive, and you can also get blood from someone who's O negative. That's you know it it stinks, but it's you know it's it's not the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is if you are O negative. If you're O negative, not only are you the rarest blood type. Not only can you only get from other O's, but now you can only get O negative blood. Okay. So if you have O negative blood and you're in an accident, you better pray that there is O negative blood at that particular hospital. Okay. It's very rare to, to, for people to have it. Therefore, it's going to be the one that's in least amount in the blood donors, right? Out of that 14 million, whatever number it was, annual um, units of blood, the least amount of one type is going to be O negative or O in general. Okay, but O negative might be the one they have in least amount because it's just not found as much in the human population, right? If you have, you know, I don't know, 10% of the human population that has O negative blood, how many of that 10% is actually donating blood? You know, I don't even know my blood type. I don't even know my kids' blood types, to be honest with you. Okay, I'm sure it's on my uh, on my birth certificate. Okay, my wife knows hers because she has. To, whenever she had, um, whenever she got pregnant, she had to get blood tests and things like that. Okay, but it's very, very rare, and it's even more rare to have O negative blood. So let me take a look at those questions that were in the chat. I probably, hopefully, I answered them. Let's see. My son has O blood but neither me or my husband have O blood. How does that happen? Okay, good question. Okay, so that goes back to Punnett squares. So uh, Tina, would you mind telling me what your blood type and your husband's blood type is, if you know it?
Why is this not working? Okay, so you're A positive and he is B positive. Okay, let me let me do this for you. But I'm, try, I'm trying to draw something here. I won't let me draw anything. I wonder why. Let me shut this out. Maybe that's why. Uh, do I not have the upload? Do I not have the fancy one or something like that? I should still be able to do this. There we go. Okay. All right. So let's do let's do some genetics. I like genetics. Okay. So here is a we're going to do something called a Punnett square. I love this stuff. Let's see how do I? There we go. I want this to be white. There we go. Okay. And then we're going to do some lines and some lines. Okay. Do this. And do this. Oop. Don't you do that. Okay. This is what we call a Punnett square. So this is how we um, figure out how individuals got the genes that they got. Where's my application thing? All right, so Tina says that she is A positive. So now that is one of your alleles, Tina. Okay, you got what that allele, that A positive allele, you got from one of your parents. Now, before you got married and had a baby, you probably knew, you most likely knew your blood type. Okay. Unlike me, who doesn't know their blood type, but you knew your blood type was a positive, but you didn't, this is called your phenotype. Okay. So when you know, when you can see or, or what, whatever the trait is being expressed, we call that a phenotype. Okay. So I have uh, brown hair. Okay. So I know that I have one allele for brown hair because I have brown hair. I could see it, right. It's an expressed trait. So that's brown, and I know I have one allele for brown. I do not know what my other allele is. I know one parent gave me a brown allele because I have brown hair. So just like you, you know one parent gave you an A allele for your blood, but you don't know what the other allele is, right? You, you, you have two, and you know one is A positive. You don't know the other one. So we're gonna, we're gonna put a question mark over here because you don't know what that is yet, okay? And the same thing happened with me with my with my kids hair color me and my wife are both black haired people brown haired people my daughter has blonde hair okay i'm pretty sure i'm 99 sure i'm the father so yeah genetics okay so over here we're gonna have your husband so, so you're on top here a, a positive in the question mark and your husband is b positive and again he knows he's b positive but he doesn't know what his other allele is he knows one of his of his alleles has to be B because he has B blood, but he doesn't know what the other one is. So we're going to put a question mark down here. Okay. So now this Punnett square, what happens is you, you basically fill it in like, uh, like connect four, when you drop um, coins and connect four, it's going to go straight down. Right. So what these four squares are, these four squares are going to be <clears throat> the probability of you having a particular child. Right. So each one of these is a potential child. Okay, so if you're if you give your child a plus or a a positive, and your husband gives your that same child b positive, then this if this child was born out of the four options, if this child was born, then that child will have a b positive blood. Okay, because you don't know the other allele. There's not much else that you can figure out unless you have kids, which is great because you do, right? And you said that your child, let me go back to the chat because I forgot what your child was. Your child has type O. Do you know if your, if your son is O negative or positive? Positive. Thank you. That was quick. Okay. Your son is O positive blood. Okay. So let me get rid of this. So that means that one of these boxes is gonna be the kid that was born, right? You have a kid who was born, so one of these, it, that kid has to fit in one of these boxes. So that, I'm gonna put your son in this box, and he has O 
positive. Okay, I'm only gonna put the positive on one because I'm not sure if both of you have given him positive blood, but you'll see in a minute. If this is your son and your son has to be one of these four boxes, and this is your son, that means that one of these O's had to be given by your husband, and one of these O's had to be given by you. So you have an O allele that you never knew about. This other allele has to be an O if your son has it, and you had to give it to him, and the same thing for your husband. So your husband's alleles are B positive and O, but we don't know if his is O negative or if it's positive, okay? We don't know that. We, there's no way for us to really figure that out. And we know that you are A positive with one allele and O for the other, and we don't know if you're positive or negative either, okay? Um, because if you give one positive and your husband gave a negative, this would still be O positive. If you gave a positive and your husband gave a positive, it would still be O positive. And if your husband gave a positive and you gave a negative, it would still be O positive, okay? The only way to really figure that out is if you, um, no, you'll never be able to. You'll never be able to have a child with O. Well, no, no, you'll never be able to, well, you might. No, you can't, sorry. It'll ne you will never be able to have a kid with O negative blood because one of you has the positive RH factor. So you'll never be able to have a kid with O negative blood. So that's your son. So both of you and your husband are both AO and BO. Okay, A positive O, B positive O. We can't tell what, for sure, we cannot tell 100% certain which one of you is O positive or O negative as far as this allele goes, but we know that your allele, your other allele is O. With me, that happened with me with eye color uh, and hair color for that matter. Okay, I have, I have brown hair, we're gonna do the capital B. My wife has brown hair. My son was born and he had brown hair, okay? I did not. I do not know what my other allele is. I do not know what my wife's other allele is. Okay, um, but my daughter came out with blonde hair, which is lower. We'll use a lowercase b for that, which means that I have to have a little b, and my wife has to have a little b if we are indeed the parents of this child. Okay, which I'm like I said, I'm pretty sure I am the dad. Okay, she hasn't told me otherwise. Okay. Now, so that means my, if I, these are my four choices. These are not choices. These are my four options of having children. Okay. With this configuration, if I take out this question mark, because I know my, I know that question mark is a little B and I know this question mark is a little B. These are the four options of kids with hair color I could have. So I have a 75% chance of getting a kid with brown hair because this, this equals brown, this equals brown. And this equals brown because it's a capital B, capital B, capital B. So I have a 75% chance of having a child. Every time I have a child, I have a 75% chance of that child coming out with brown hair. Every time I have a child, I have a 25% chance of that child coming out with blonde hair. And that happened with my daughter. Okay. She has blonde hair. What is the possibility of not having a child because of blood type differences? I don't know what you mean by that. You can always, there's, you'll, you'll never not have a baby because the father and the mother's blood types are incompatible. That's not how it works. There is a chance of the baby not being born because the mother's blood is mixing with the baby's blood, okay? Because the mom and the baby don't always have to have the same blood type, right? A mom can have blood type A and the baby can have blood type O and the mom's blood cannot mix with the baby's blood and then you can have a miscarriage. 
but when you're doing alleles and you're giving A's and O's as alleles, not as actual physical blood yet, that will never result in not having, not being able to have a child. Uh, another question was, let me see. Okay, my brother has green eyes like my dad and both my grandfathers, but my mom, my siblings, and I have brown eyes. So it's the same concept. Yes, it's absolutely the same concept. Okay, my, so then now, if we, that got us to thinking, like, how is it that my daughter has blonde hair and blue eyes when I have brown hair, and brown eyes, my mom, my two brothers, and my father all have brown eyes and brown hair. Okay, my wife's mom and dad have brown eyes and brown hair. Where did the blonde allele come from? Where did the blue eye, because my daughter has blonde hair and blue eyes. Where did the blonde hair and blue eyed alleles come from? You have to start looking back in, in your family tree and, and it might show up and it might not show up. With me, we didn't find it in previous people, right? We didn't find it in, on my side of the family, we didn't find it in uh, grandparents and aunts or uncles. We found it in the, the cousins, right? So my brother has a kid with blue eyes. I have a kid with blue eyes. My daughter has a, um, I'm sorry, my sister has a daughter with blue eyes and, and blonde hair. So it's there. It just wasn't manifested till later in life. Now my, my wife, on the other hand, her sister had blonde hair and blue eyes. So we knew that it was in the family, right? So it's pretty, genetics is really interesting. That's not what this um, class is supposed to be about, but it's, it's pretty interesting. Okay, so that, that was blood type. Let's get back to, to this. So, that was, I, so that's basically what all this is about. Let me, let me clear this off here. Okay, here's a picture of basically the same thing that I just drew. I just wanted to draw it on my own. Here's a slide about RH, which is the same thing that I just talked about. Here is that what I was just talking about um, with that question that I just answered urethroblastosis uh, fetalis. This is when the mother's blood uh, is not the same as the child's blood and can mix with the child's blood and ultimately result in you know, a miscarriage. Oh, I got one more question here. You're welcome, anytime. Thank you for asking me. Okay. Okay, let's, uh, let's do... Let's do a little bit more and then I'll give you guys a break. Okay, let's just, look. I wanna get through a little bit more here and then I'll give you guys a break. Okay, so your blood plasma, again, is the liquid part of your blood uh, minus the whole formed elements. Okay, uh, a lot of this is just gonna be reiteration of what we talked about at the beginning. Okay, the composition of, your, of the plasma is again, gonna be foods with salts, things like you know carbohydrates, lipids, things like that. About 3% of your total oxygen is transported through your blood. About 5% of your total carbon dioxide is transported through your blood, not through your lungs and things like that. Okay. Uh, again, here are the most abundant solutes, things that are dissolved in your plasma, these proteins. Okay. There are things called clotting factors in the body. And these clotting factors are chemicals made by your liver to help your blood clot. You don't want clotting factors necessarily floating around in your plasma all the time. You only want them when you need them, right? So when you have a cut, when you have a wound, when you're bleeding, uh, you want you, your body produces clotting factors at that time. Uh, if you take the clotting factors out of your, your blood plasma, then we call that serum, right? Blood serum. Essentially, it's the same thing. Okay. <clears throat> your serum does contain antibodies that are produced by your B cells and your, and your immune system. Okay, once again, the formed elements are gonna be um, red blood cells for the most part. The majority of your um, formed elements will be these red blood cells. And then a very, very small portion will be these leukocytes. And we have a whole bunch of different types of leukocytes. Okay, we have granular leukocytes, which are our neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. And when we say granular, it means like it looks like the, the nucleus looks grainy. Okay, it doesn't look like just like a solid circle. It looks like it's sand. Okay, little grains of, of, of nuclei. Okay, we have non-granular leukocytes called lymphocytes and monocytes, which have very large uh, solid nuclei. And then we have platelets and thrombocytes, which are gonna help you 
um, to you know clot your blood and things like that. Once again, here are the numbers, same numbers from the from that earlier slide. You know, you have millions and millions of red blood cells per you know unit of blood. You have very little white blood cells per unit of blood in a normal, healthy human being. If this was an if this was a human being that had an infection, then this number would be a lot higher. Okay, some would be you know ten times higher than it is now. And if this person had HIV infection, this number would be a lot lower. Okay, and that's the danger of of HIV is that this number gets too low and, and you can't fight infections. But we'll talk about that when we get to the immune system. Okay, and there's your platelet number. Again, even um, it's not, not as little as the white blood cells, but it's not nearly as large as the erythrocytes, okay? Um, the formation of red blood cells, that happens in what we call myeloid tissue, which is uh, bone marrow. Okay, we, we took the, a look at bone marrow when we were talking about the skeletal system last semester. And we said that there was yellow marrow and red marrow in the diaphysis and the epiphyses of the bones. And we call that myeloid tissue. And that's where all of your red blood cells are gonna be made and a, and a handful of your white blood cells will be made. They're not all of them though. Most of your white blood cells are gonna come from your lymphatic system, uh, which is your immune system. And they come from your lymph nodes, they come from your thymus gland, and they come from your spleen. And you can live without a spleen, but it does decrease the ability of your immune system to fight infection because you're not producing as many white blood cells. Okay, and that's where I want to take a little break. Okay, so it is 1017. Okay, we'll take about, um, we'll come back at 1040. Okay, we'll take a 23 minute break. You guys have been good. You've been listening to me for over an hour or so. All right, I'll see you guys in about 23 minutes.